today's cyber threat environment, many organizations are struggling to determine how to mitigate the array of risks they are facing. But don't despair, said Andy Jabor, the co-founder and managing director of Gate15, there is hope. Andy recently wrote a series of blogs outlining how the preparedness cycle, which is often used to prepare for traditional threats, can easily be applied to cyber threats as well. On today's Cyber Chat, we talked to Andy about the preparedness cycle and how organizations can best implement that cycle to reduce their cyber risk. You've been writing about the preparedness cycle on Surfwatch Labs blog and how organizations can use it to better manage their cyber risks. I uh, wonder if you could just give a, a brief overview of what the preparedness cycle is. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Jeff. So the preparedness cycle has been around for quite a long time now, and it's been used by uh, the Department of Homeland Security, FEMA, other federal, state, and local government agencies as part of managing the preparedness process. It's also been used by private sector organizations for a long time. That's where the idea of applying it towards cyber risk is maybe something people don't necessarily think about right away, um, but, but it certainly applies very well. And so to sort of talk about what it is, um, you know, as we wrote about in the blog post, preparedness can be defined as a continuous cycle of planning, organizing, training, equipping, exercising, evaluating, and then taking the corrective actions to support effective incident response. And that process applies across all domains. We're talking about natural hazards, uh, terrorism, uh, other physical security concerns, pandemics, and certainly with cybersecurity and cyber risk matters as well. Those steps make up the cycle itself. And in the blogs, we address those in more or less that order. We broke some down as we're discussing preparedness and operational planning as two uh, related but separate components. And we pulled some together, uh, grouping, organizing, and equipping together in one blog, which, which you often see those two terms put together. So that's, that's kind of the, the very succinct version of, of what it is as an idea, as a concept, as a methodology. Yeah, then I wonder if you could just elaborate a bit on how organizations actually should go about applying this. Because, you know, as we see all the time, there's just a ton of different cyber risks out there and different threats that organizations face. And I, I believe you actually wrote in the intro to the series that no organization is able to specifically address every threat and every risk. So how should organizations go about, you know, using this cycle and deciding what threats to focus on and how far to go through the cycle with each threat? If you could just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's a lot of, you know, a lot of things to consider when we, when we talk to things like this. You know, I think terminology matters. I think we also understand that, you know, people are going to do things a little bit differently. Um, so, you know, we, we have one approach we like to encourage folks to consider, but there's many ways to tackle this. But we believe it all starts with a, with a sound understanding of threats, right? And we talk about threats, we talk about risk. Sometimes we confuse those terms. So I like to go back to doctrine because I don't trust my own definitions. And so I look at the DHS risk lexicon, and they define their threat there as a natural or man-made occurrence, individual, entity, or action that has or indicates potential to harm life, information, operations, the environment, and or property. All right, so that, that's our starting point. That's a threat. And I think we need to understand the, the broad array of threats an organization can face to include the various uh, cyber threats. When we talk about risk, now that same reference defines risk as a potential for unwanted outcomes resulting from an incident, event, or occurrence as determined by its likelihood and the associated consequences. All right, so once, on one end, we start with threats. We understand this broad community of threats that are out there. And we've got to sort of say, okay, I, I can't do everything. So let me, let me develop a risk assessment or, or some other tool that my organization wants to use and sort of prioritize what are the biggest risks to my organization and what are the ones that I can reasonably try and mitigate through preparedness. And then we start to tackle those. So we begin to sound understanding the threat environment. And for cyber risk, that means understanding the tactics, techniques, and procedures that are being used to conduct attacks. But it also means looking at the accident, supply chain, and other non-deliberate threats that exist. Right? We're all hearing a lot about data breaches and ransomware and social media hacking and various other deliberate attacks. We also consider threats like who we're relying on and how does that pose a threat to our organization. And we've seen incidents of that causing issues for a variety of organizations where their third-party organization, their supply chain, their dependencies have led to data breaches that have affected them. Maybe most notably, it's something you guys covered recently with uh, the Sabre data breach that just affected a number of hospitality organizations. Uh, my team recently experienced a third-order impact when a website host uh, got DDoS, 
impacting a service that we rely on to support uh, some of our project work. We weren't the target, nor was the effective technology we were using, but we were disrupted nonetheless because there was basically a supply chain dependency that was affected, right? And so those things are out there. They can affect any number of ways. Once we understand the broad threats that we as an organization may face, then we can start to assess the risks. And like you just said in your, in your question there, no one has time to tackle every threat or to build a plan uh, for every potential you know, situation that may arise. So we need to build adaptable plans and focus on addressing the most important risks, right? And prioritizing risks, the two most common terms I think we'll here refer to are either developing a risk assessment or business impact assessment. And, and those are trying to basically you know, assess the, the, the impact of, of one of those risks on our organization, right? Taking threats and saying, how much is really going to impact my organization? And so uh, there are some simple formulas people use, such as risk equals impact times probability or risk equals threat times vulnerability times consequences or different ways to look at assessing risk. And whether we literally score them or if we subjectively assess them, right, whether we have a deliberate organizational process or somebody's told, this is your mission, you figure this out. What we're trying to do here is measure how bad something would be if it happens and how likely it is, in fact, to happen. Just because something is potentially terrible doesn't mean I'm going to focus a lot of time and effort there, right? So looking at a few examples from across the, the, the broad spectrum of the security universe, and I may assess the impact of a nuclear device as, as completely devastating, but my ability to really react and do anything about that might be insignificant, right? It might just be too big for me to do anything with. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time and effort addressing that. However, if I operate in a major seismic zone, like on the West Coast or the new Madrid seismic zone in the middle states, then I might need to conduct some preparedness activities to address the potential earthquake scenario. In cyber risk, we can look at the threats we're seeing and try and assess the likelihood of impacting us. A DDoS attack, business email compromise, ransomware, phishing, and so forth. There are some things I probably need to think about and give at least some level of attention and time to uh, to help mitigate the likelihood of those those incidents in my organization. But one of the things we talked about in the uh, the blog a couple times was in the idea of developing a multi-year plan. I mean, they want to develop a basic incident response plan that provides a general basis by respond, regardless of the type of incident. We can then detail out some specific actions based on where we want to focus. For some risks, we want to provide training and educate staff on both the threat and expected responses. For our greater concerns, we want to take that further to exercise specific responses to certain incidents. We can't do all of it, but we can do some. And if, we, if we're smart, we can try to put sort of things together to get the most bang for our buck in both our training and our exercises. And one of the ways you can do that is by developing a flexible multi-year plan that can sort of progressively build up and sure we cover a variety of areas and security concerns and add enough flexibility to be able to address, you know, evolving and growing cyber risk concerns in our environment. You talked about, you know, trying to get the most bang for your buck. I think obviously all organizations want to try to get that when addressing their cyber risk. So if they're implementing this cycle, uh, to try to to do that, are there any, I guess, common challenges that come up or best practices that they can use to try to, to get that best bang for their buck? Yeah, I think I think there's a lot of things that we sort of see pretty commonly. I mean, among the common challenges, I think typically preparedness efforts um, are one of those areas that tend to be under-resourced, whether you're doing it in-house or getting external help for something like that. Typically, you're not able to spend as much as you probably like to to do as completely as you want. So, you know, both in time and in people to proper support an effective exercise program, not being given enough time to conduct the appropriate activities in either in planning or in conduct or in the after actions process. Also, sometimes not having genuine support from leadership to make the changes we may want to achieve the desired levels of organizational preparedness and resilience, right? So, unfortunately, sometimes people sort of want to check the block where it's really drive the organization to a higher level. And that's really a challenge that, that we see, you know, in a lot of organizations, public sector and private sector. There's also the challenge of not having uh, dedicated personnel to the effort, right? Having the term like you champion to lead preparedness. And that's particularly challenging in small and mid-sized organizations where you can't dedicate, you know, one person to something like that. So it becomes at best an additional duty that, you know, often can get sort of marginalized by more pressing day-to-day requirements. So those are some areas I think all organizations can struggle with and and can try and take actions to make better. As far as best practices, I think one of the best things an organization can do is something we mentioned a couple times in the the blog series, 
And that goes back to what I just said a moment ago and uh, developing a multi-year training exercise program. Doing that does a lot, includes forcing deliberate thought as to how to progress the organization towards a desired level of preparedness. And it allows leaders to understand that progression, potential budget implications, and to plan and dedicate the needed time to do those activities. So it's really a good structure to, to put into place and to follow. It's also important to have someone champion preparedness. So as I was just mentioning, if you can get somebody to commit to that, that's great. In a large organization, that may mean someone leading the preparedness program and then an executive supporting them in the effort. So maybe they have a little bit of authority and can make things happen versus sort of going around and pleading with people, which is often the case, you know, a junior team member might be, be stuck in. It's important that leadership is on board. It's important that someone is responsible for keeping the program moving forward. You know, that might be that one individual in an organization, or it might be a couple people that, that sort of operational champion, as well as that executive that can sort of hammer, you know, as needed behind them and, and ensure things are getting done towards uh, mitigating cyber risks. You closed the, the series of blog posts talking about the importance of evaluating the progress that you're making and seeking continuous improvement in this process. So a final question then, uh, big picture, I'm wondering how you would evaluate the cyber threat landscape and the progress that organizations are making you know, over the past few years in mitigating the, the many risks that they're facing. I think like, like a lot of areas dealing with cybersecurity, um, I think we're learning and we're improving. Uh, this is a relatively new and very fast-changing area. And it's a lot less understood than dealing with some of the, the, the longer-term things we've seen in the past, like fraud or, as we're seeing in Texas right now, with hurricanes or theft issues, where we've got a longer history of sort of what these things mean to our organization. Uh, for risk managers, there's still a lot of learning and uncomfortable estimating required right now. We're seeing more resources being put towards understanding organizational threats and the ability to effectively gain awareness of those threats, including issues that may reveal themselves on the dark web. And we're seeing more collaboration across organizational lines to help build community resilience and readiness. So I think we're moving in a positive direction, but as technology increases so rapidly, you know, whether we're talking about the Internet of Things or drones or robotics, um, and the bad guys are constantly, creatively and aggressively attacking organizations I'm not sure leaders are doing enough to keep up with the pace that these things are, are moving. It's tough. The reality is organizations need to ensure they're able to understand the threats, reasonably assess the associated risks, and then adequately, adequately prepare for those prioritized risk concerns. All right, so I, I think we're doing well. Um, I think we're getting better. But in a very fast-changing, rapidly evolving cyber threat environment, uh, I think we still have a long way to go, to be honest. All right. Well, thanks for taking the time, Andy. I appreciate it. Thanks, Jeff. I've really enjoyed uh, being able to do the series and, and enjoy collaborating with the Surfwatch team. So thanks for the opportunity. To see Andy's blog series on reducing cyber risk via the preparedness cycle, check out the link in the podcast description. The Cyber Chat is brought to you by Surfwatch Labs. Surfwatch Labs helps organizations and service providers quickly establish a strategic cyber threat intelligence operation that drives more effective use of their tactical defenses. For more information on cyber risk intelligence, check out surfwatchlabs.com.